Good evening. Welcome to this panel discussion on changing international alignments in Sweden, Denmark and Finland, which is hosted by the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. I want to thank Professor Brendan Sims, the Director of the Centre for Geopolitics and his colleagues for their support in organising this event. It is the next in our Baltic Geopolitical Programme series. For your information, our next online event will be on November the 8th, addressing Scotland and the Baltic from the early modern period to the present day. And we have a number of other online and uh, in-person events before Christmas. We've had a lot of interest, and I'm delighted to say that with our colleagues in the network of universities in the region, we are now building a substantial programme of events and activities and a regular newsletter. If you're watching this and you haven't yet done so, please sign up to receive our regular material. About 50 people have registered for this event this evening. It's an online video panel, which will end at 18.30 UK time, 6.30 promptly. I will moderate a discussion with the panelists for the first half hour. And then in the second half, I will relay questions from the audience to our panelists. You as the audience, will be able to see and hear me and the panelists. You will have your microphone and camera switched off automatically, so at no time will you be heard or seen by anyone in this webinar. However, you are still able to communicate with me and the panelists. At the bottom of your screen, there is a question and answer, a Q&A option. If you click on it and when it opens, you have the chance to type questions. If you do type questions, and I hope you will, Please start by writing your name and your affiliation first. If your question is for a specific panellist, please state that at the outset as well. I will try and cover as many of your questions as possible, though in view of the numbers and time constraints, it's possible we might not be able to address everyone's question. Finally, I need to let you know that this video panel is being recorded and we will post the recording on our website over the next few days. As I said, the title of our panel this evening is Changing International Alignments in Sweden, Denmark and Finland. For many of us, the traditional image of the Scandinavian Baltic societies is as prosperous, tolerant, open-minded, embodying respect for human rights and a strong and humane welfare state. And in some of those cases, at any rate, a deep disposition to geopolitical neutrality. However, the politics of these countries is changing dramatically and has been for a number of years. The most recent manifestations of this are the decisions of Sweden and Finland to join NATO, the electoral performance of the Sweden Democrats in the September 2022 general election, and the decisions of the Danish Social Democrat government to adopt pretty hardline anti-immigration positions in, avoid, in order to avoid giving political ground to their opposition, Danish People's Party. There is a range of underlying reasons for these changes, including the increased salience of immigration as a political issue, including Russia's decision to invade Ukraine on the 24th of February this year, and including the widespread challenges faced by Scandinavian star social democracy, so-called, across Europe. These developments have caused political parties to change their positions significantly. For example, the Swedish and Finnish Social Democrats decided to back NATO membership, and the Sweden Democrats have abandoned their active support for Swedish withdrawal from the European Union and are also backing NATO membership. These changes, as we speak, are being tested at the voting polls. Following the Swedish general election on 11th September this year, a new Swedish government was formed on the 17th of October, just a week or so ago, led by the Moderaten and with the support of the Sweden Democrats on the basis that their migration policies will form an important part of the government programme. On the 5th of October, Denmark's general election was brought forward from June 2023 to yesterday, November the 1st, 2022. And the Finnish general election will probably take place in April 2023 against the background of the Finns party performing strongly in current opinion polls. It's a fast moving situation, 
and our panel discusses why these changes have happened, what they mean for future geopolitical stance of these important countries, and what are the implications of this for geopolitical security in the region. We have an excellent panel of three people to discuss this. The panelists will each present for seven to 10 minutes, and will, after all three have presented, we will have questions and answers to the panel from myself and participants. It will be moderated by myself. My name is Charles Clark. I'm a co-founder of the Baltic Geopolitics Programme at Cambridge. Our three panelists are Dr. Anders Wilpfeld, Professor Heike Patamaki, and Charlotte Flint Paterson. I'll introduce each of them before uh, they speak. So I'll start with Dr. Anders Wittfeld. Anders is a senior lecturer at the School of Social Science in the University of Aberdeen. He's Swedish in origin, uh, obtained his doctoral degree from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. His main research interests are political parties, populism and right-wing extremism and radicalism. Among his recent publications on these topics are Extreme Right Parties in Scandinavia, which was published six or seven years ago. He has a great deal of expertise and we're very grateful that he's joining us this evening uh, from Aberdeen. He's going to focus on the responses across the region to the increased salience of immigration as a political issue and on the particular Swedish situation. Anders, you're very welcome and we look forward to hearing what it is you have to say. Thank you. Well, uh, the situation uh, in Sweden, I suppose in many ways, uh, goes against uh, the broader understanding of Sweden as a country uh, as a tolerant and internationalist uh, and has it become more parochial and prejudiced and my own take on that is that that both those premises are slightly exaggerated um, um, but before I come back to that just a brief recap of the situation Charles you already uh, mentioned these things, but maybe it's a good idea to just recap the recent developments that uh, last month a government in Sweden was formed uh, that in some ways was new, historical and unique. It was a minority centre-right coalition led by the moderate, i.e. Conservative Party, and also containing the Christian Democrats and the Liberals. But it was also supported by the Sweden Democrats, which is an interesting development. Uh, the Sweden Democrats aren't in the government, they don't have cabinet posts, but they have staff working in the government organization as observers to make sure that what they've agreed with the government will really be put into practice. And this agreement between the four parties, the three government parties and the Sweden Democrats was codified in the so-called TIDA agreement, so named after a castle where the negotiations took place and is now being put into practice. The Swedish Minister for Justice just today gave a press conference where he outlined significant increased fund, significantly increased funding for police and, and, um, and the justice system. Um, so clearly this is new uh, in several ways, but uh, most importantly because the Sweden Democrats have gone from isolation to influence, and secondly uh, because uh, of course, this TIDA agreement, among other things, contains significantly reduced immigration um, and, and mi migration policies. But I should add here that the Swedish migration policy had already been tightened before, uh, already as a consequence of the two 2015 so-called migration crisis. And there is a little bit of a war of words now between the government and the opposition Social Democrats, where the opposition, where the government where the, and the Sweden Democrats are arguing that uh, uh, this is a, a shift of paradigm in Swedish migration policy, whereas a Social Democrat, former prime minister and Social Democrat opposition leader is arguing that the paradigm shift took place already in 2015, when a then Social Democratic government significantly tightened the asylum policy. Of course, the Sweden Democrats have argued what will happen then wasn't enough, um, but uh, they, um, uh, th there is a debate sort of when the shift of paradigm took place, and I think that's going to continue to be a bit of a battle. Clearly, though, the Social Democrats do not oppose this shift. The smaller parties on the left and the Greens, they are not happy with the development, but the Social Democrats essentially do not particularly want to re return to an earlier period of, of high immigration which of course had consequences. I mean, you, Sweden, Sweden has at the moment uh, a population of 10.4 million, uh, 
and of those about one in five are born abroad and if you add to that those that have been born in Sweden but with foreign parents you're talking about 25 percent of the population with foreign origin so clearly Sweden has become very multicultural as a consequence of what used to be a generous migration policy but that seems to be changing now and there also seems to be cross-block support for this the other development is of course that Charles uh, um, mentioned was of course the NATO application which seemed completely unthinkable this time a year ago this time a year ago the Swedish Minister for Defense Peter Hultqvist he said that um, there won't be any membership application as long as there is a social democratic government I will never um, as long as I'm the defense minister, participate in such a process. That I can guarantee everyone. He spoke those words on the 6th of November last year. Then following the invasion in Ukraine, the Social Democrats completely changed and rather abruptly uh, took a new decision. There was a tokenistic consultation among the membership. And then in May, uh, they decided they will support uh, a NATO application. So that was an abrupt change. Um, the Sweden Democrats had previously changed their opposition to um, uh, NATO um, uh, membership. And of course, the Swedish now process to join NATO is in full flow, but has, has hit a problem with Turkey, whose leader Erdogan uh, wants Sweden to extradite uh, alleged PKK terrorists to Turkey um, in, in order to allow uh, the Swedish me membership application to, to be ratified. Um, Hungary has also not yet ratified the Swedish membership, but I think that uh, everything I hear is that that will happen quite soon and that will be less of an issue, but the Turkish situation is still a bit in the balance. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got much time left, Charles. Um, you said seven to ten minutes. I have lots more in my notes here, but uh, um, I, I, will, I um, uh, could also just then Add because it, in some ways it would be interesting to say a few words about the Sweden Democrats and their sort of elevation um, to the position as a government support party, very similar to the role or previous role of the Danish People's Party in Denmark. Uh, in other words, not being in the government, but being, being a government support party, which was a very successful strategy for the, for, the, for the Danish People's Party, but then kind of backfired on them when they tried it again. And it's now regarded by the party as a mistake not to have joined the government, but they could have done so in 2015. The Sweden Democrats at the moment uh, are, I think, um, uh, I think um, um, uh, the Sweden Democrats at the moment, they are um, uh, in a very favorable position. Uh, and they have also grown in support exponentially since they broke through into parliament in 2010. Um, their background is interesting and, and in some ways very different to many comparable parties in the Nordic country. So they have, when they were formed in 1988, they had a number of very problematical people involved in the formation of the party, people with Nazi backgrounds. And we're talking some veterans from Nazi organizations from the 1940s. That would not be the case of the Danish People's Party or the Progress Party in Norway or the Finns Party. They don't have that kind of problem in, in its history and origins and background. The Sweden Democrats have that burden, what a Norwegian scholar, Ivar Slaten, called the reputational shield that the Sweden Democrats don't have. In other words, they 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 almost like toxic because of this background so they had to work very hard to tidy up the party image and they were able to do so but it took a long while it took took many many years before they were eventually made themselves presentable to the general public but public opinion in my view they were looking at data provided by the university of gothenburg has uh, continuously shown that there's been a fertile ground for a party with a sweden democrats agenda the demand has always been there, but that wasn't the, the, what they didn't used to be. Was a party able to supply um, a package that would meet that demand? So that would be the problem. That the, there were the Sweden Democrats were regarded as too extreme and too compromised by their origins. But they've been trying to polish up their image, and gradually they have been able to gain a foothold in the electorate. Um, so, in some ways, therefore, if I were to summarize this. Uh, the Swedish development is certainly changing. I would say, uh, arguably, that the Swedish changes in migration policy is more, more a question of aligning itself to what has become a new European norm. Uh, 
uh, the, the, the TIDA agreement states that Swedish um, um, asylum policy will have, is going to be aligned to the baseline level possible within uh, the framework of the EU. And I think that is, um, uh, so in that sense, Sweden has more or less of an outlier and more sort of an, an, an average European country in that sense. Uh, when it comes to the NATO membership, of course, that is also, I mean, joining um, forces with uh, Norway and Denmark who have been members of NATO since the late 1940s, and of course, Finland, who are joining at the same time. And of course, interestingly, of course, and I'm sure Professor Palomeke will, uh, sorry, Patomeke, apologies, um, will... Um, uh, um, will will el uh, elaborate on this because it, it seems that Turkey are less uh, suspicious of the Finnish application than the Swedish one. It seems that they have more of a problem with the Swedish one than with the Finnish one. I think that's probably my time up, but I'm happy to elaborate if there's anything that uh, is left hanging in the air. Anders, that's really great. Very many thanks for that. Um, we'll take the presentations from uh, Heike and Charlotte and then come back with questions. But just to say, one of the questions I'll certainly want to come back with you and both the others as well is how resilient you think these changes are. You described a very rapid change, for example, in attitudes to NATO. Is that something that might reverse itself in the next two or three years, or is it a pretty long-standing change and so on? But I'll come back to that later on. That was tremendous, exactly what we were looking for. Our second panelist is Professor Heike uh, Patamaki, who's Professor of World Politics at the University of Helsinki, uh, where you are at the moment, I think, Heike, in, the, in your home in the middle of uh, Helsinki, a beautiful city. Uh, Heike has had a number of international university associations, a very strong record of publication in a variety of different ways. But I thought I'd just pick out um, uh, an article he wrote uh, earlier this year in June, entitled The End of the Nordic Ideal, Finland and Sweden joining NATO. And so that is exactly spot on the kind of subject we're trying to discuss today. And in the blurb that introduced it, you said, during the Cold War, the Norden was widely seen as the model of an enlightened and anti-militaristic society that follows the principles of distributive justice and is morally superior to two alternative models of modernization, the United States and the Soviet Union. The two countries that best exemplified the Nordic model and neutrality were Sweden and Finland. And so the question is, to what extent that's changed? And Heike, I'm hoping you're going to uh, discuss that question, but also look at the response across the region to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how that changed the overall climate and on the particular situation in Finland, which you, of course, know very well. So we look forward to hearing you, Heike. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Indeed, my presentation will be based on the uh, Le Monde Diplomatic article and similar uh, lines of reasoning. I will share my screen with, uh, I have a uh, few slides to show. So um, let me start with the, um, the first one as soon as the computer works. Take a second. Hmm. Okay, here we are. The, um, <clears throat> the origins of Finnish neutrality and also the welfare state lies in the Cold War situation. Um, Finland's history is much more complicated than the history of Sweden in the sense that Sweden has been a neutral country since the 19th century. Uh, Finland only became um, independent in 1918 or no, late 1917, and, the, um, uh, and there was a civil war and there were all kinds of, of things. Finland was uh, very much part of the, uh, the uh, Second World War uh, in various ways. Um, so the, after the complicated uh, Second World War history, Finland found itself in a position where it became the only non-communist country to sign an agreement of friendship, uh, cooperation, and mutual assistance with the, uh, the Soviet Union. And that happened in 1948. Finland was also among the, uh, the few countries and followed the example of the Soviet Union in re refusing USA under the Marshall Plan. And uh, thereby Finland uh, became a sort of neutral, but its neutrality 
was a contested uh, issue, and uh, Finland's uh, foreign policy leadership struggled very hard until the late 1980s to get its uh, neutrality recognized by both parties of the Cold War. The, um, nonetheless, uh, in the early 1950s, Urho Kekkonen, who became a president of Finland for 25 years, gave a famous speech, so-called pyjama pocket uh, speech, where he uh, made a very strong call for peace in Europe. Uh, but in that speech, he also linked uh, the neutrality of Finland and its Nordic identity together. And this identity, not only the uh, success, successes of the labor movement and the socialist and social democratic parties, but this identity, the Cold War identity of neutrality, enabled Finland to follow the Swedish model of building, building a democratic welfare state. And, the, um, and this was at a time uh, when there was a very systematic economic planning for economic growth. There was a lot of technological dy dy dynamism, urbanization, and, um, and, and so on. The, um, Finland became a very different country from the poor agricultural society that it used to be uh, before the Second World War. The, um, uh, what happened uh, the, um, during the Cold War in the, in the Nordic area was um, uh, very deep integration among these countries. And uh, the integration actually went deeper than uh, what is the current state of integration in the European Union, at least in some ways. Denmark and Norway were NATO members. Finland had this particular treaty with the Soviet Union. And nonetheless, military tensions were much lower in the Nordic area than in Central Europe. Then uh, finally, in 1955, Finland joined the Nordic Council uh, with the other Nordic countries and the at that point, I mean, what we had in, in the nor northern part of Europe was a passport-free movement of citizens, a common labor market, and a shared so social security system. And this is something that is uh, still not the case, the latter, I mean, uh, shared social security system in the European Union. The, um, Sweden was um, active in its foreign policy, internationalist in, in all kinds of ways, and particularly since the times um, of Olof Palme, the um, people became very famous for that. And this was based on the hegemony of social democratic values and ideas in, in Sweden. In the case of Finland, this was um, somewhat different because Finland was more pragmatist and was more coping with the Cold War situation in terms of some sort of real politique or political realism. But that's change. And, uh, towards the late 1960s and early 1970s, they emerged increasingly this idea that the, um, Finland can also play a role in overcoming the uh, difference between the two blocks. And the, this was also based on a particular history uh, or philosophy of history, if you like, um, the convergence theory, the idea that the, uh, the difference between capitalism and socialism will be overcome by uh, democratic uh, or social democracy or democratic socialism of some sort. This started to change uh, already in the 1970s. The, um, in the case of Sweden, uh, the, uh, the rise of multinationals, in fact, uh, Sweden uh, had many multinational corporations already before the First World War, but there was this period of disintegration of the world economy after the Second World War. Um, the, um, the rise of multinationals meant that the um, uh, capital started to have more and more exit options from Sweden. The, uh, there was a big struggle, very famous struggle over, over the so-called wage earner funds in the, in the 1970s. And, the, um, and then there was the oil crisis. And all this led to the uh, social democrats uh, uh, the, to their, uh, facing their first electoral defeat in 1976. In 44 years, I mean, they had been in power. When the Social Democrats returned to power in, in the early 1980s, they redefined the third way. Before that, it was the um, third way between capitalism and socialism. From now on, it was the third way between neoliberalism and uh, the old social democracy. The, um, this was followed by the deregulation of the financial markets. Finland and Norway followed suit very quickly. 
And this led to a typical boom and bust cycle uh, and a major banking and, and currency crisis occurred in the early 1990s. In the case of Finland, this was particularly severe. Fin Finnish GDP uh, collapsed by something like 14%. In the early 1990s, I mean, the unemployment rate at one point was um, close to 20%, and so on and so forth. It was in this context, at the end of the Cold War, the heyday of the, um, the Western liberalism, and so on and so forth, and with this deep economic crisis, that the um, uh, many started to uh, not only advocate neoliberalism, but that act also Finlandization. And in all these, uh, the uh, Nordic countries, there was a lot of talk about to about the need to move with the times. And so this uh, was the beginning of all kinds of changes. Um, and this, uh, the, um, these developments were soon followed by the, uh, the um, various other international developments. The, um, in the early 1990s, um, it was revealed that Sweden, in fact, during the Cold War had very intimate ties with, with NATO. In fact, the, uh, Sweden was a kind of a, military but not political member of NATO during the Cold War. So it was only Finland that was actually neutral in both ways. The, um, uh, Sweden uh, started to lead the Nordic countries also in other ways away from the Nordic model, in particular through the um, uh, EU membership application uh, in 1992. Uh, there were a referenda in uh, these three countries, Finland, uh, Sweden, and Norway, starting with Finland. Finland and Sweden uh, joined. Norway uh, decided to stay out. What happened as a consequence of this was that the, um, the Nordic identity was redefined, or these countries were redefined as European and Western uh, countries, and in con at least in some contrast, the Nordic neutrality. And the, um, the new term that was um, adopted at this time was military non-alignment. Uh, so neutrality came to an end already in the early or mid 1990s. This was also the time when the discussions about NATO membership uh, started. Personally, I remember that the, um, I already predicted uh, in a TV interview, uh, was it 1993 or 1994, that the um, Finland uh, will uh, send a a membership uh, application uh, relatively soon. All kinds of things happened after that, I mean, including also the uh, instability in Russia, and there were pressures also from the outside to, uh, to stabilize the Nordic area, and so it was postponed for a very long time. However, in military terms, there was a, a very close integration with NATO uh, since this time. Um, since 1994, Finland and Sweden have participated in NATO's partnership for peace program. The Finnish armed forces have been uh, aligned with NATO systems. Uh, they are totally compatible and have been for a while uh, already. The um, both countries uh, participated in the 2000s and 2010s in NATO's so-called uh, peace support operations. And they also signed NATO host nation support agreements in the uh, mid uh, 2010s. The, um, so there has been a gradual turn toward NATO, and this also happened in the political uh, sphere as well. The main newspaper of Finland, Helsinki Sanoma, decided explicitly to support, well, I mean, that was tacit as far as the wider audience is concerned, but I mean, within the, the newspaper itself, it was well known, decided to support NATO, NATO membership already at the time of the Kosovo crisis in 1999. The Conservative Party, called Kokomus, uh, adopted this policy in 2006, and most of the media has followed suit since then. The, um, there was a kind of a peak of um, anti-Russian and pro-NATO sentiment at the time of the Ukrainian crisis of 2013 and 14, uh, the time of the Crimean annexation and the beginning of the war in eastern Ukraine. But then uh, when things stabilized, and the, um, the political leadership in Finland, including uh, President Niinistö, they continued the old policy. So the public opinion seemed to settle uh, on the previous understanding that the um, Finland uh, should continue the policy of military non-alignment. But this um, was the final phase of what I would call the period of punctuated equilibrium. So the it's from the 
surface level, it seems that the, there was continuity to the past, but in fact, the underlying forces were, were already um, changing quite a lot and the context was changing as well. And so they, the, this um, was in fact much less stable than what it appeared to be on the basis of public opinion polls. The, um, um, what happened uh, the, um, with the 2022 invasion of Ukraine was uh, a sudden turn. I mean, all of a sudden it seemed that 80, 90% of the Finns are in support of NATO membership. At this time also the survey questions in fact changed somewhat. And it was also because the punctuated equilibrium came to an end. The, the change uh, seemed actually much more dramatic that, than it in fact was. There was a long history in preparation for this kind of an outcome. The, um, what has happened also is that the decision to join NATO has come uh, amid a militarization of society and a belief in the uh, deterrence theory and the capacity of military to prevent war. The idea of common good that was uh, relatively widespread during the Cold War has vanished from these discussions. The, um, uh, as said, I mean, for instance, the OSCE or CSE initiative, the Helsinki process of 1975 was a good example of that kind of a thinking. It's actually contributed to the end of the Cold War. From now on, it seems that Finns have actually adopted the Cold War mentality. Uh, it is all about deterrence, including nu nuclear deterrence. And that's the only hope uh, for peace and stability that we might have. So you need to inspire fear in the one who is feared. Of course, there are all kinds of assumptions here. I, I don't have the time to go through those, but the, um, I find the, the theory rather um, weak and there are other ways of understanding how security is actually built. That was also the prevalent understanding in Finland and other Nordic countries of East Sweden. Uh, until the uh, the uh, um, until lately, the um, um, this has also the 2022 invasion. I mean, this has also like already in 2013 and 2014, there was this kind of a turn toward the view that uh, Russia is simply an evil empire and that there's a kind of a mannequin stuck between good and evil in the world. Uh, this has now become the mainstream, and it's very difficult to say anything uh, different uh, without being framed as a Putinist or something along, along those lines. Finally, what are the geopolitical implications of these uh, changes? The, um, in my view, uh, the fact that Finland and Sweden are now joining NATO is, is in fact a step into escalation of conflict, conflict between Russia and the West. The, um, we, we know that the expansion of, of NATO has been a key factor in this process. And of course, particularly with the Finnish uh, membership, there will be now a long border between uh, NATO and Russia in the northern part of the uh, uh, military alliance. But what is more important from my point of view is, that the, um, is the global implications of this. Because the decision to join NATO uh, tends to reinforce the division of the world as a whole into two different camps. And the, um, um, the, the expansion of NATO, and particular military alliance, instead of common institutions like the United Nations, obviously uh, concerns also Asia and, and the global south. And the, um, to put this into some kind of a perspective, we might compare uh, the situation to the Australians and Americans being concerned about the Solomon Islands recent security ac agreement with China. So different parts of the world are very jealously uh, looking at what the, the strategic moves of the other are. And it is within this global game that the, um, uh, the membership of Finland and Sweden uh, should be seen. And in my view, there's a kind of a partial historical analogy to the um, developments that led to the First World War. Um, the, I've been using this uh, partial historical analogy since uh, the 2000s in the Political Economy of Global Security book uh, published in 2008. I already warned that this is the, the future that we are he heading towards. Um, unfortunately, that scenario seems to have come true. 
the world has not been this close to uh, a nuclear war since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. And even though this, uh, the, uh, the probability might still be relatively low, some people are talking about 10 to 20 percent, that's of course obviously giving the consequences of nuclear war totally intolerable. But even if the, um, the catastrophe doesn't happen in the immediate future, these kinds of developments will continue and the, the Finnish and Swedish membership in NATO are very much part of the, that kind of a development, unless uh, something can change the course of world history. And the, uh, my conclusion is simply that the uh, Finland and Sweden are now on the wrong side of history. Thank you. And here is the little more diplomatic article if somebody is interested in reading it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that a very challenging presentation. We've already had some uh, questions to you on particular aspects of Finland, uh, which have come through. And of course, the way you've uh, made the argument is a challenging one, which there'll be many people participating who will have questions to discuss with you. But we'll leave that until the point of uh, the overall Q&A. But thank you very much indeed for that presentation. Now we now come to Charlotte Flint Pedersen, the executive director of the Danish Foreign Policy Society, who has an MA from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, for about a decade, she was deputy director and head of the international division at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And uh, Charlotte's going to focus on the geopolitical implications of these changes and on the particular Danish situation. Perhaps I could say just before asking you to start, Charlotte, that Denmark's, uh, the, the fact that you've come third in this presentation means we've had quite a lot on Sweden and quite a lot on Finland. And I'm sure people would welcome your observations on Denmark and very much any differences you see in the history as, you, as it's been described for the other two countries. And of course, a great deal of interest in your assessment of the Swedish uh, of the Danish general election, which took place yesterday. So Charlotte, we're very much delighted that you, you're joining us today. Thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I'll take you a bit on sort of the history as because this really shows the differences between Denmark and especially Sweden in terms of the, uh, you know, how politics have evolved and Anna's was speaking a bit about it as well. Um, so um, for the past 20 years since uh, Prime Minister Anna's Fogh Rasmussen from the Liberal Party, he realized uh, in 2001 that if he was to run a right-wing government, he couldn't do it without the support of the Danish People's Party, which hither though had been sort of not uh, acceptable, not uh, like he called it uh, clean to be part of the good company. Uh, and the Danish People's Party is an anti-immigration party mainly, uh, with actually also uh, an element of having, you know, support for workers and trying to grab the uh, people who are uh, lost in the global, you know, the globalization and these things. But, but so it's a right-wing party with a social democratic flavor, you could say, and then an anti-immigration element. Um, and he gave them the possibility to support his government. And then from then on, and for the past 20 years, and I was at that time uh, at the Danish Institute for Human Rights, actually the Danish Center for Human Rights. And just to illustrate what happened was that the Danish Center for Human Rights was actually closed on demand from uh, the Danish People's Party. It was part of their, um, their demands to Anders Fogh Rasmussen's government that they would close the Danish Center for Human Rights because they saw human rights as something which was very much supporting migration, uh, refugees and mig migrants. So I was actually directly affected by the politics that take pl place at that time. Luckily, there was two wide and international support for the Danish Center for Human Rights. So we reopened very briefly in a very short after as the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Uh, and uh, the thing is the Danish Institute for Human Rights is a government or a national human rights institution. So it's actually the decision of government. It's not a civil society organization, but just to say that that was actually human rights became political and politicized at that moment. And the, uh, the, one of the main goals was actually to change the, the idea of Denmark becoming a multicultural society towards a society was found on so-called Danish values, uh, 
whatever that implies. Uh, so if you migrate to Denmark, you would need to subscribe to um, these uh, Danish values, and you would also need to uh, and, and it tests uh, for and controls on who became citizens were introduced, making it also difficult to make, take your spouse or your partner to Denmark. Uh, and uh, drastically reducing the number of refugees being accepted into Denmark and so much more. And latest has been the outsourcing of asylum treatment to Rwanda, which is not in effect, but is something which has been discussed just like the UK example. And finally, in terms of foreign policy, it also introduced a skepticism, a skepticism towards EU into Danish foreign policy, which actually embraced more also the center parties, both at the, on the right and the left wing. Uh, so for 20 years, actually, the Danish People's Party could do no wrong. And they had actually, at some point, support of up to 20% of the Danish voters. So they influenced nearly all policy areas, from human rights, criminal justice, to housing, to cultural politics, to welfare, etc. They sat in all the committees and they sat on the financial committee of the Danish parliament. Or they were actually in charge of the financial committee in the Danish parliament. So they could also see through, you know, who got which funds for what and could actually veto it or negotiate on it. So they affected in, in a, to a very large degree the Danish society. And, you know, the whole issue of uh, migration became the most important problem in Denmark for nearly all all the center parties as well. And gradually these parties adopted the policies of the Danish People's Party. And I think most successfully our Social Democratic Party um, has adopted them lately. And uh, this has actually also led to a change in um, the general elections, which I'll come to now. Um, so, because what is really interesting the general elections which took place yesterday has actually changed everything so the, the trajectory of the past 10 to 20 years uh, are now over for the first time in 20, 20 years this election was not about migration and not about values and not about foreigners and not about cultural differences even though some of the politicians on the right wing desperately tried to make it so but what happened was that the Danish People's Party had barely actually reached the threshold level for entering into the uh, Danish parliament. They just made it, but only barely. Um, and the elections was about health, climate, economy, taxes, education, labor market, demography, and how to expand the workforce in order to support the future of our welfare society. So totally different issues. Uh, and all the politics and all the discussions and all the media attention was about the center and not about the parties to the very right or to the very left. Uh, so it was actually an anti-populist, I would say, actually discussion taking place. It was about politics. Um, and today the social democratic government has just dissolved the government, which means they have said, okay, they got a very good election. So the, the best elections that the Social Democratic Party has received for more than 20 years, which means uh, it was a great success for our prime minister. And I think especially how she steered Denmark through the COVID-19 crisis, but also because she's seen as a very strong, um, nearly presidential type of prime minister who, is also somebody you would feel secure about. And that was also her, you could say, slogan, uh, safe, through, um, safe through insecure times, that she is in, in, you know, in terms of what's going on in Ukraine, also seen as the person who can actually steer us through this. And she's gone to the Queen today to ask permission to investigate the possibility of forming a government, bridging left and right. So again, politics is centering around the center and not to the, to the very right or to the very left. They, there's no influence of the, the populist parties or the charismatic leader parties actually in, in, the, in the coming negotiations that come around a, a form, you know, the, the coming government. And um, 
This is because there has been a realization that there is a need and for broad-based reforms. We have a, a rising inflation. We have a health sector that is really has been, uh, there's not been sufficient investments into them. There's been a defense sector which has been underinvested for a very long time. And we need now to get to the 2% that the, the NATO Alliance uh, requires. It's only 1.4 at the moment. Um, there's an education system, and then there's the whole issue around the, you know, having more people within, you know, broadening the workforce. And here, even though you can uh, rise the level of the pension area uh, age, there is a realization that we need to broaden up for migration in order to secure a stronger um, and broader workforce. So these are some of the issues that has been on the election. There was 14 parties running. That's a huge amount. A lot of the parties were running on, I, I forgot about climate and climate change has also been a huge issue. And a lot of the parties had a climate uh, agenda actually on, on the left wing. And, um, and this, is, uh, this is also very important. Um, so what uh, are the geopolitical changes after the general election? So first of all, there are very, really very few political differences within the Danish political spectrum, even with 14 different parties in the area of foreign and security policy. Um, we had a referendum uh, to remove the Danish opt out on defense, on the EU defense corporation in the spring. 67% of the voters voted to remove this opt out. So whereas uh, Sweden and Finland uh, has uh, agreed to join NATO, Denmark has agreed to join the EU on the defense corporation. And therefore you could say a major issue on the Danish uh, election agenda on foreign security policy was also reviewed. Everybody agreed to join the EU corporation. And even now the left-wing voters, which has been skeptical of the EU has moved towards a more EU positive approach and have decided that they want to change the EU from within and not from the outside. So there is really very little uh, disagreement on EU at the moment. Um, so what are the opportunities? Well, the geographical proximity and the cultural similarity and the large overlap now of political and military goals with uh, Finland and Sweden becoming members of, members of NATO and Denmark becoming part of the EU Defense Corporation means that there's a huge potential for strengthened cooperation among the Nordics. And this will apply probably both to operational matters, exercises, information sharing, and building a common situational picture, material development on cooperation and host nation support. And the new situation also creates a potential for the Nordic countries in the respect of defense industries. So I think there's a huge potential for, 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 for cooperation among the, the Nordic countries. And, and here I probably differ a bit from Heik, Professor Heike's uh, uh, picture of things, but I see a huge potential from the Danish foreign policy perspective, a huge potential for, for alignment. Uh, within the area of uh, foreign policy and, to, and, and defense area. Um, however, there are these historic differences that we have heard about uh, and also uh, different security policy traditions that will take some time to, 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 to uh, political energy to overcome. Um, also now we have in Sweden with the elections of the moderates and the Swedish Democrats and where we have now the social democratic government, there will be some political differences that might impede the, the close cooperation. But I don't see that we have major differences in terms of uh, foreign policy security. I, I know that Sweden has now decided to leave the feminist uh, foreign policy, but I don't think it means a huge difference. Um, and, and Denmark has not adop adopted a feminist uh, foreign policy. Um, and then there's the fact that Denmark has not been very engaged and has been less engaged in the Nordic military and security cooperation. But I think this is something that again, will uh, Denmark will engage in as now. And uh, 
here NORDEFCO is an important focal point for Nordic military and security policy cooperation. So um, finally, uh, I will get to the, um, yeah, oh, just another thing which I think will, will be important is the, uh, the potential for a broader security policy cooperation, which is uh, more than just defense, is that the Nordic brand remain strong on the global stage and in the UN. And this could off also offer a platform for increased efforts for conflict resolution and stabilization on support to the UN in the area of, for example, sustainable development goals, climate uh, cooperation and energy cooperation. So finally, what uh, does this mean for the future of the geopolitical stance of Denmark? Um, so the election re results will not change the Danish geopolitical stand um, we will remain and have a very close cooperation, transatlantic cooperation. And this is uh, something which is a tradition, very traditional for Denmark that we uh, uh, have been sort of uh, engaged in a close cooperation with the US, which sometimes has cost our cooperation with the EU and even with the Nordic countries. But this is, uh, will remain because the US is seen as a guarantor, especially within the Atlantic or Arctic cooperation in Greenland, but will increase our EU involvement. Uh, this is also in anticipation of what's going to happen in the US uh, in the next presidential elections, where we don't know who will actually be the next US president. Uh, well, there'll be a very strong support to the UN and the rule-based order in which we will uh, try to follow up uh, on trying to get a seat at the U UN Security Council uh, and take over the mandate of um, the, the Norwegian. Uh, they, the Nor Norway is sitting now in the UN Security Council and we're trying to, to actually step in there. Uh, we'll continue the strong support to Ukraine. And maybe, I don't know, this is a guessing, but I think also we'll be become more and more in favor of uh, EU uh, enlargement uh, due to the fact that we see that as also a geopolitical question where the EU can enlarge both to the east and to the south towards the Balkans. Uh, and then we'll increase our defense expenditures toward 2%. Uh, as soon as the government is in place, there will be a, a negotiations on the coming defense deal for the next 10 years. And then we will secure the continued close cooperation within the Baltic region, also with the Baltic states. So this is how I see the, the future of, uh, you could say the, the Danish uh, foreign policy and geopolitical stance. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, and, it, and, the, and the, actually the elections, I think the close, the sense, the very, the elections results on the very sort of center approach is actually also um, been strengthened due to the war in uh, Ukraine. So I think that has increased the, 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 fo the voters focus on, on having a, a, a center approach to, to the politics and, and who they're electing for to. So thank you very much. Apologies for not for speaking through mute then. I say again, thank you to the three of you for three tremendous presentations. It's been extremely positive and very, very helpful. We've had some questions coming in on some specific points, and I'll come to those a bit later on. Um, but there's also been a significant chain difference of emphasis uh, amongst the three of you on some of these issues. Are Finland and Sweden on the wrong side of history and so on? How that uh, discussion goes? And so I want to just kick off by asking all three of you just to comment on how resilient you think the changes you've described are. And as you were talking about the changes of position by the various Swedish political parties towards NATO membership, is that something you think that will last over a period of time? Or is it something which you think we can expect to see changes in the next five years or so? Uh, Heike, you, as I say, described uh, a very interesting history of an account of a steady move on in relation to Finland in particular towards more integration uh, with NATO, which you thought was uh, moving in the wrong direction for the reasons that you described. 
do you see that continuing the, what you described or do you think there'll be a change and uh, Charlotte, you were describing how this being the first election in 20 years where the issues around migration and populism had not uh, really been a feature in the campaign, but other wider political questions, really because the Social Democrats had, uh, had adopted many of the approaches that had previously been proposed by the, uh, uh, by the uh, Danish People's Party in these areas. Again, is that a stable trend, do you think? Or do you think that actually we'll be back into the populist debates and so on uh, before very long? Could I just perhaps ask the, all three of you just to comment on how resilient these changes which have been taking place are and whether they're going to continue or whether we're going to see a reverse And I'll ask Anders you to kick off and then I'll go to, through the same order, Heike and Charlotte. And then I'll bring in a couple of the questions on the chat, but can I say to the participants, please feel free to bring in more questions on the chat. But first, this resilience question, uh, Anders. Okay, thank you. Um, well, beginning briefly with migration policy, I find that to be very likely to remain in place. I can't see any reversal of that. So the, the migration policy will, will continue to be um, restrictive and that is also perhaps um, uh, 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 bringing in uh, Charlotte's points about Nordic cooperation. The fact that Swedish migration policy is better aligned or more aligned with the, the, those of Denmark and Norway may actually enhance Nordic cooperation. And then what you think of that policy is an entirely separate issue. But but I think that that, that will remain resilient. I can't see um, any. In fact, I can see that in a broader European scale. Uh, restricted migration policies are probably here to stay in the foreseeable future. That's my judgment. But then the NATO question that you mentioned, and I think that I can't see any sort of short to medium term changes in this. And now we're taking this step. I think what lots of people would consider it completely inconsistent to all of a sudden start starting to argue that we should leave NATO. But it will in the longer term depend on what, what the NATO membership brings. One early test is, of course, that if this process of placating Erdogan in Turkey will sooner or later lead to revelations of rather sort of unethical extraditions of alleged so-called terrorists who aren't necessarily terrorists, but are just sort of extradited to please the Turkish uh, government, if, if any such stories are, relieved, re are revealed, then that could lead to a debate that could question the whole premises under which Sweden joined NATO. In the longer term also, I think, of course, NATO membership is mostly at the moment uh, framed in, as, as a protection. But of course, um, it also involves obligations. And if those obligations lead to Sweden being involved or in, affected in various ways in international conflicts, the way that might not have happened um, during the, the Swedish era of non-alignment. And even though I, I'm completely aware that Professor Patomek said about Sweden being sort of de facto very closely aligned with NATO during the Cold War, uh, there, there wasn't the obligations that follow in NATO membership, and that meant that Sweden could play a more independent role on the international arena. Uh, now, if the NATO membership will have consequences um, that will constrain Sweden, Sweden's um, behavior on the international arena but also being involved being you know in the i'm saying not saying this is going to happen anytime soon but the swedish troops being sent to somewhere uh um, and in 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 a conflict that isn't necessarily very supported uh, by the public then of course support for the nato membership could could change so nato membership is a little bit more in the balance but i can't see any short to medium changes uh, in the opinion about that Thank you. That's very clear, Anders. Heike, do you have comments both on what uh, Anders has said, but also on your sense of uh, a programme of worse and worse situation leading to great risks? Do you see any changes in that happening from your point of view? No, first of all, I agree with Anders that the, um, uh, the um, uh, submission to the Turkish blackmail, if you like, <laughs> might actually uh, lead to some kind of change in public opinion and in some uh, among some politicians as well. I think in terms of public opinion, we have seen the peak of uh, support for NATO membership. 
that is true. There will be some leveling uh, over time, but the uh, I think the uh, the changes are uh, irreversible at least for the time being. The um, I don't think that the uh, we will return to anything close to the previous levels of support for military non-alignment in the foreseeable future. Of course, a lot depends on what will happen in Ukraine and whether peace agreement will be achieved at some point and so on and so forth. But there is also the, um, the, the problem that many decisions are, are very long term. If Finland decides to buy, uh, buy um, major um, F-35 uh, jet planes from the United States, I mean, that's a decision that commits Finland for the next 15 years. The, um, uh, or more, actually 30 years or so. The um, uh, decision to join NATO is actually irreversible to the extent that, I mean, um, no country has ever uh, decided to withdraw from NATO. And it's very unlikely that Finland, given its history, for instance, in the European Union, um, would um, the, consider such an option in the foreseeable future. So I think this is a long-term commitment for the next 20 years at the, at the very least, um, unless something like a total military catastrophe in Europe happens, nuclear weapons will be used and the whole world will be totally transformed. But in the absence of such a uh, disaster, I don't think that the, uh, this will change very quickly. Rather, I see that given the institutional lock-ins and the um, uh, self-reinforcing tendencies of public opinion, the commitments of political parties in Finland, I mean, all of them, including the left alliance that was um, mostly, uh, the, the party that was um, most in favor of military non-alignment, if not neutrality, even that party and its leadership supported NATO membership. I mean, there's actually no opposition in Finland at the moment. I mean, there are some individuals some public intellectuals, a few members of parliament, few politicians here and there, but I mean, there is no organized opposition to these uh, changes. So I actually think that the, um, the current developments will continue, and those in include also the uh, thorough militarization of the Finnish society. Thank you. Very clear. Charlotte, what's your assessment in particular about whether migration will or won't and populism will return into Danish politics? Well, I think actually uh, there will, of course, be uh, there. There are still the popular parties, and and especially the party calling the Danish Democrats, with Inga Støjberg, who is uh, trying to copy the Swedish Democrats' uh, thinking, is of course a, she's a very popular figure, the head of this uh, party, but. Uh, if she doesn't get influence uh, in the coming uh, government, I think she might have, it might be difficult for her to uphold uh, this populist uh, thinking. So we'll have populist parties within the Danish parliament for a long time. And uh, uh, I think that that's coming, but I think the, 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 I think actually the war in Ukraine and the Corona crisis have actually uh, helped us uh, get this very strong uh, social democratic government and some you could say people say okay it's not this is not the time to be wild this is the time to be to to be centered and clever um, so i think it will hold on to the next general elections and something different will happen so um, and but the thing is actually that a lot of the issues that were addressed by the Danish People's Party, and maybe rightfully so, has been solved. You have a very strong, uh, you have a, a much larger political participation from the people with an uh, immigrant background in, in Denmark today, also, which will also be seen in the Danish uh, parliament, but it, most of all in the Danish local politics, you have a very high degree of participation. You have uh, actually a very, the success of um, uh, migrants in the uh, Danish labor market has also been is to, is getting better by the year. And this can be seen. So you could say some of, and even crime is under, uh, the crime rates and everything is uh, being reduced. So you don't have, these are not any longer any issues. It's very difficult to make it a political issue when it's actually not a political problem. And so what is at the moment are the political problems is actually some of the uh, 
actually the issues have, have not been addressed in the 20 years that we have been discussing migration policies. And these are the broad reforms on how to actually to finance this uh, welfare society. And actually the migration policies has actually impeded us in finding solutions on how to finance this welfare society and how to make a labor force that can actually support the functions in the, uh, in the um, health sector, in the sector for old people in the sector. So there are some issues that need, where you need a decisions over the parliamentary divide in order to make them long lasting. And that is why at the moment, I think you, you at least see for the next three or four years, I think there will be no differences in, in terms of the politics that we have at the moment. I also like to add, uh, in, you know, how do we see the NATO and the, uh, the, uh, the, the NATO applications of Finland and Sweden? For us, it's actually, we have our security have been increased dramatically because all of a sudden the strait of, of the Baltic Sea into through Danish waters are now secured through Finland and Sweden. So you could say that that in itself is, uh, is something that is seen very positively from, from the Danish side all over the, the political sector. Okay, thank you very much all of you for that. I think it's very interesting the way you've been describing uh, pretty much universally the fact that these changes aren't short-term changes they're longer-term changes which will be established obviously to be tested by events but uh, nevertheless that's an important shift now um, we've had questions we've got a number of questions coming in i'd uh, in, invite more still a couple from colin barnes who is at cambridge and uh, is from the uh, uh, Cambridge Centre for Environmental Energy and Natural Resource Governance. He's got a couple of questions which Heike, I'm going to ask you to deal with first because they are specifically about Finland. He says, firstly, given Finland's relationships with the Soviet Union, was there ever any discussion about Karelia, which was, quote, snatched by the USSR, I think, following the Winter War, returning to Finland? Has there ever been a discussion of Karelia returning to Finland? And his second question, more generally, is to what extent do Finland and Norway collaborate with respect to the Russian threat, given they both share a border with Russia, Finland having a much longer border than Norway with Russia, of course. So, Heike, could I ask you to tackle those first two and then ask uh, Charlotte and Anders if there's anything that you'd like to add to what Heike said. Heike. Thank you. Um, the um... The idea of Karelia being returned to Finland um, was on the agenda during the Cold War. And particularly uh, in the 1960s, I mean, President Kekkonen actually had discussions with the Soviet leadership about the possibility of um, uh, returning Karelia in exchange for some um, other forms of cooperation on the Finnish side. Um, but nonetheless, it was discussed. Uh, but, uh, but actually, um, only emerged from these discussions was the um, so-called Saimaa Channel, uh, the um, a water route to the Baltic Sea from the Finnish lakes through the so Soviet Union, now through Russia. Um, so it never uh, was realized in the, in the 1960s. Um, since the um, end of the Cold War, uh, I mean, the, there has been a long period of time uh, from the um, 19. 40s and the um, obviously the more time passes by I mean the less obvious it is that the uh, a very Russianized uh, part of the world would be returned to Finland I mean it was typically associated with the very right-wing nationalist uh, policies and the um, uh, it didn't have any widespread support among the Finnish public uh, or the political parties in Finland so the um, I think that has been more or less uh, the um, forgotten as a as a topic, and the um, and the fact is that the uh, for uh, 70, 80 years uh, there has been a, a totally new population. I mean, no, very few Finns, hardly ever any, uh, we are left in the living in Karelia in 1944. They all be offered the possibility of finding a new place somewhere else in Finland. 
including my grandparents, for instance. And the um, uh, and of course, I mean, they, that generation might have had nostalgia for the return of Karelia. Uh, I don't think that nostalgia uh, lives anymore. It, it is nowhere to be found. And obviously, there's this consensus that the, the idea of starting to renegotiate past borders uh, opens up a kind of a Pandora's box. But the, um, there's, uh, there are so many possible historical claims for different areas. and. Karelia obviously has been a kind of a contested area for uh, centuries, if not longer. And the, uh, uh, so I don't, th there is absolutely no support for the idea, even in, under the current circumstances that the Karelia would be returned to Finland. But in the 1960s, when there was only, uh, the, the, only something like 20 years had passed on the uh, Second World War, it was still a kind of a live issue. And then it was really negotiated with the Finnish and Soviet leadership. Regarding the uh, border cooperation between Finland and Norway, I'm no expert on this. I have very little to say, say about it. Uh, but as far as I know, I mean, the main attention, at least on the Finnish side, has been to close the borders for the Russians, including uh, building a fence uh, between Finland and Russia. And the, uh, this fence is uh, not unlike the fences that we've, be, we've been seeing in other parts of the world, including uh, the um, uh, fence between the United States and Mexico, or um, Poland and Belarus, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, very similar developments in different parts of the world. Uh, the, um, as far as I know, I mean, the, this is no concern to Norway. I mean, these are separate decisions and separate issues, but the, there's a kind of a common thread uh, that goes through these decisions of different countries. Thank you very much. Charlotte, do you have anything to add to what Heike said on these questions? Well, uh, I, I, actually, I don't know much, so much about the cooperation between Norway and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Finland on this, but uh, I think there's something very interesting to be taught about the cooperation of Norway with uh, Russia. Um, on the border because they have the Barents uh, Declaration in which they cooperate actually on fishing and fishery even now in these very difficult circumstances. And there's been the cooperation uh, between the Kola Hela Island and, and the, you could say the Barents area and on, on migration and opening up. So there are some, I think some interesting things to be learned from the Nor Norwegian way of cooperating with Russia though Things are very difficult at the moment, um, but uh, for for us, it's uh, it's interesting to, to to see what can actually be done. And I know that the Nordic Council of Ministers has done a lot to support the uh, the population in uh, Karelia uh, in terms of education and progress and everything. So uh, I think there's also an interesting to uh, you know there's interesting to look at what kind of role the Nordic Council of Ministers can play within the Nordic countries, especially now that we are actually more, more beginning to be aligned in, in more or less the same uh, organizational frameworks. Thank you very much, very interesting point. I'll come back to Nordic cooperation in a moment, which is a subject you raised Charlotte earlier on as well. Anders, anything you'd like to add to what Heike and Charlotte have said on this questions? Well, it clearly is an area where he knows much more than, than I do. Uh, I'm just, uh, it's very interesting, this history with Karelia and, 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 and fascinating cities like Vipuri with a fascinating history. Uh, it used to be a very multicultural, very multilingual. And, and uh, I have seen documentaries on uh, Swedish language programs on Finnish television about this. And I think there is a bit of... of uh, well, it's it's almost a, a lot of people in Finland are feeling sad how these places have decayed after they became Russian. They have not been, been well kept, and, and these were beautiful places. But uh, I, I mean, I've nothing really to add to that except these these reflections about the Norwegian situation. Uh, again, uh, this is not my area either, but but I have noticed in the news lately that, that Norway has had a number of security scares with um, strange drones and arrests of what seem to be alleged Russian agents in on in Norway and there seems to be um, and I think there is also some I've seen some geopolitical 
suggestions that, that Russia may be interested in the far north Norwegian district of Finnmark, the northernmost sort of district of Norway, which is on, in, in, in the east borders with, with Russia. Uh, and, and, but, but exactly the, how, how this will work with, with Nordic cooperation is probably a bit too early to say. I think that the, 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 a lot of these things will probably happen. If they happen, they will happen without much prior warning, I would imagine. Okay. Thank you. Now, we've got an interesting question from Henny Lie Skarpolt. I'm probably not pronouncing not in the name right, who is a Norwegian student at the Cambridge University Scott Polar Research Institute. Um, and the question is, following the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, some politicians in Norway criticised NATO's expansion and Norway's membership. They argued that we should focus on creating a Nordic military alliance better suited to pursuing the strategy of deterrence and reassurance towards Russia. Uh, he would like to hear your thoughts on whether this should be something at all to consider. And also, do you see this as being a possibility in the future? So raising the possibility rather than NATO of a, quote, Nordic military alliance better suited to pursuing the strategy of deterrence and reassurance towards Russia. So to the panellists, what do you think of this? Do you want to kick off, Anders? OK, well, this very proposal is, you know, set the, the tone for the Cold War, because when Norway and Denmark joined NATO and Sweden didn't, that was after the then Swedish Prime Minister, Targa Erlanda, had unsuccessfully tried to negotiate such a Nordic defence alliance. But it eventually became clear that Denmark and Norway weren't interested. They felt more secure in NATO. And then that led to the configuration we had during, this, during the Cold War. Uh, whether this could revive now, it would involve, Den if I understand the premises correctly, it would involve Denmark and, and Norway leaving NATO and joining in a defence bloc with, with the other Nordic countries. And I can see that as an interesting idea, but it would... I, I can't see it military. See it becoming in, in real, realistically becoming militarily anywhere near strong enough. And I'm also don't know whether that would have been possible in the 1940s either. But that's a separate question. I, I can't see how, how it could build up a, a, a some kind of independence of NATO uh, a, 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 and, and being strong enough. I, I, I can't see that happening. And I also don't think there is any public or political support in Denmark. Or, or Norway for leaving NATO and joining such an alliance. They said no in 1949, 48, 49, and they're probably going to do so again. I think there are some individuals in Sweden who would kind of be open to this suggestion, even though you don't hear them in the debate at the moment. Uh, and almost like uh, some social democrats would be very happy to return to the uh, foiled plan of Erlander. Uh, but I think uh, it's unlikely to, to, to reach... Um, well, um, to, 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 to become a, a serious discussion, I would imagine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlotte, any observations on this idea? Yeah, I think, it, like, like Anna was saying, the, the, there's not popular support for it, but that's one thing. Another thing is that you could say that Denmark has uh, like been very aware of the fact that we are covered by the American nuclear umbrella, and that is very much part of the whole system of deterrence in terms of Russia's nuclear, nuclear arsenal. And so that would imply if we create a Nordic cooperation on defenses, would we then have nuclear arms in order to have a nuclear deterrence? Uh, and I guess not. And I also think actually what you could see from both Finland and, and, and Sweden is that while they were non, they, were, like, they had neutrality, they would have to build up their defense industries to a much larger extent than actually Denmark has done. So in many ways, we have been able to invest our money in welfare rather than defense, um, even though now we have to live up to the 2%. Uh, so actually, for me, uh, having a sort of a Nordic cooperation would actually mean maybe that we would have to militarize our societies even more than we have at the moment. I don't, I don't see for sure, but I think it's, it's some of that. So I guess what I see much more likely is that within the Nordic countries, we perform a sort of a Nordic alliance within the NATO 
And I think that's much more interesting than actually leaving NATO. Uh, but of course, all this will change depending on who will become the next American president. So if we have a, an American president who is not actually supporting the uh, Article 5, the, Na the Solidarity Act of uh, NATO, then this might change. But until then, we, I don't think there's any support for the idea here in Denmark. Okay, thank you. And Heike, how do you respond to this idea? Well, first of all, I, I think that Charlotte's points in a way reinforce my analysis that the um, now the uh, with Finland and Sweden joining uh, the NATO, they are committed to the uh, theory of nuclear deterrence. And the, um, uh, this was not the case during the Cold War. To the contrary, uh, both, the, both Finland and Sweden, and particularly Finland, made many proposals for nuclear weapons free zone in the in the northern in the Nordic countries. And this is a very much uh, against the idea of nuclear deterrence. I and mean, nuclear weapons are seen as a threat to humanity and the future of humanity, not as something that um, actually secures in any way. They are the threat. And this has changed totally. Anyway, um, as far as the um, uh, military cooperation between the Nordic countries is concerned, there's obviously a very long history to this. Um, not only uh, we have both Finland and Sweden, uh, sorry, Finland and Norway part of Sweden for a very long time, the uh, different periods of history, but um, also uh, during the interwar period between the First and Second World War, there were all kinds of um, initiatives to develop some some forms of cooperation, military cooperation between the Nordic countries, and also uh, during the Cold War, this time, um, occasion, this idea occasionally emerged. The um, after the end of the Cold War, um, the, there have been some proposals uh, more confined to Finland and Sweden only, that Finland and Sweden could actually cooperate militarily and that the, some kind of a military alliance between the two countries might be a substitute for NATO membership. And as late as after the uh, beginning of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, um, some Finnish politicians, uh, particularly Erki Tuomio, who was a uh, uh, foreign minister of Finland for 10 years, uh, the, um, uh, proposed something along these lines, but very quickly he also started to support NATO membership as well. But I mean, at least, I mean, he was thinking that this might be a discussion worth having uh, before joining NATO. So um, I agree with Anders and Charlotte that the, uh, it is highly unlikely that Norway and Denmark would uh, ever consider um, the um, disjoining NATO in order to be uh, able to form some kind of a military alliance with Finland and Sweden. But even in the case of Finland and Sweden, after the um, uh, members, membership applications, it seems that the, um, this is uh, now an ir irreversible uh, development. So the um, counterfactually in the past, there might have been some possibilities of forming such a military alliance. At the moment, I don't see this happening um, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Charlotte, you want, just want to add something quickly, and then I'm going to go to the final round of questions. Charlotte. Yeah, because yeah, uh, I think what we also have here is that we now have three countries who are members of the EU Defence Corporation. And I think really I, I see things also going in that direction, that we within the EU, here we don't have Norway, but within the EU we would see uh, an increased cooperation between the Nordic countries on defense. Um, and that I think is, is a uh, higher likability. Um, yeah. Okay, now we've got about five minutes left. So I'm now going to go to a couple of questions and then a final round of answers from the three of you, please. The two questions have come in on the chat. One is from Esmira Ritsaeva, who's an alumna of the University of Helsinki and also the University of Cambridge, particularly addressing uh, her question to you, Heike, referring to your book, The Political Economy of Global Security, War, Future Crises and Changes in Global Governance, which you wrote about 15 years ago. Would a multipolar world order strengthen or weaken NATO unity in the future is the question. Then the next is a question from Colin Barnes again, following from these interesting presentations, what about the collaboration of Nordic countries with the Baltic countries, uh, i.e. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, 
on defence and the economy. And I'll tie that in with a general question to a theme that's been here, not talking about a separate organisation, but within NATO, within the EU. Uh, how strong do you think the possibility of tighter Nordic and Baltic cooperation is? Whether it's on the issues like we were discussing at the beginning about migration and rules on migration and how that operates, whether it's on the military and security issues as represented by NATO membership, uh, how high a priority would you say uh, Nordic slash Baltic cooperation is on these questions? I'll go first to you, Heike, as it was this question about your book and then to the other two. Heike. Thank you. Um... Well, I mean, the point of the book is really to argue for um, better common global institutions. I don't think that the, um, these um, contradictions and, and dilemmas can be easily resolved without developing some forms of corporations, corporations that are also um, institutionalized. And the, um, uh, so the, the scenarios for uh, better possible futures are totally dependent on there be some kind of a transformation, spatial transformations for better systems of global governance. The multipolarity versus uh, some kind of um, hegemony or unipolarity, uh, that was uh, the case after the end of the Cold War. That, uh, that question to me uh, is uh, kind of an honest start. It, it doesn't really address the, the key issues. The, the problem lies precisely at the moment that the, there's a um, a uh, total conflict between these two uh, uh, options that the Russians and the Chinese to a certain degree are criticizing the West uh, on the basis that they are trying to uh, dictate the terms to the rest of the world. Uh, they are not only hegemonic, but actually dominant in that sense. And they use military power whenever they wish, independently of international law, but they don't allow anybody else to do the same thing and so on and so forth. Whereas the from the US perspective and the Western perspective, I mean, the idea is that we have certain rules. Of course, these rules have been mostly set by the West, um, and the, everybody else uh, should be following them because these are the liberal rules uh, based on state sovereignty, human rights, democracy, and the rest of it. Of course, there's a total contradiction between the idea of state sovereignty and human rights that are universal and, and, and the idea of democracy as well, because, I mean, uh, if you believe in state sovereignty, that it is somehow uh, uh, the, um, that everybody should be respecting it, I mean, it actually implies that you can't um, intervene in the internal affairs of, of the other countries because I mean, they can organize their internal affairs in the way they like. There are all kinds of other contradictions in, in the current system. I don't think the, um, the problem lies in the, uh, in the possibility of multipolarity. Rather, I think that the, uh, there's a, in international relations, there's a theory of hegemonic stability, for instance. I mean, to me, the real question is, after the hegemony of the United States, will we see, or should we see, any new hegemony? Or should we rather see some kind of a system of, of cooperation that we could even uh, think in terms of some sort of global democracy, uh, rather than a system of separate nation states that are continuing with this uh, uh, situation of security dilemma, deterrence, including nuclear deterrence, and so on and so forth. Even though we know that if there's a uh, possibility of using nuclear weapons, uh, that is uh, the probability of which is uh, bigger than zero, the, um, and if this continues long enough, uh, a nuclear war is a certain. And the, uh, that kind of a development for me is, uh, is inconceivable. I can't imagine uh, that we can continue for a very long time along these lines, but uh, some sort of a fundamental change is necessary. And that was the key point of the political economy and global security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heike, for your very clear uh, presentation of the positions that you've set out. Charlotte, can I have your concluding comments, please? Yes, uh, regarding the cooperation on the uh, the Baltic, I think Denmark has a very close cooperation with the Baltic, both on defence uh, and on on climate and uh, in, in many other ways. Uh, the Baltics see the Nordic countries as a, a development model, and therefore we also have a, a great possibility for influence in the Baltic. And and I I, I think this will continue uh, very much so. Uh, 
in the future. Um, I, I see here we have, uh, the only thing is that the Baltic Sea Cooperation Council, or the council is now uh, in effective, uh, very in a difficult position because of, of Russia and, and the role there. But I, I, I see that there will be increased cooperation around the Baltic Sea. Uh, on, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Anders, you've got the last word. to answer those questions and to give a concluding statement or both uh, uh, whichever you prefer your choice yes i think that ultimately these questions about baltic cooperation and multipolar i think this is a little bit outside my expertise and i think that what's been said by both charlotte and heike have been extremely thoughtful and and and, and helpful so i don't know if i should really try to add much to that no, I think uh, my overall uh, feeling about the situation uh, in Sweden and the Nordic countries is that, that it's quite mixed and they can take many different twists and turns. I think political developments these days happen very quickly, very abruptly, very suddenly. I think Charlotte's points earlier that it'll depend entirely, a lot of things will depend entirely on who's the next American president, I think is an extremely valid point, and we can't do much about that. Uh, but it also depends on on other things that, for example, um, it, 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 I mean, one thing that, that studying politics for many years and teaching it for over 30 is that things that seem a completely stable project doesn't seem to last. So the situation we have in Sweden now could change completely in a few years or even less than that. Similarly with Denmark and Finland. Um, I'm just thinking about political projects that seem to be almost you know, solid, seemed to be there forever. The, the, the Reinfeldt government in Sweden from 2006 to 2014 seemed to be the, the ultimate solution of cent centrism that seemed to be almost unassailable. Well, that didn't last very long. The centrism or the full Rasmussen government, the same in Denmark, it seemed to be almost like it, to last forever. It didn't. Uh, Macron in France, you can see that unraveling now. A, a centrist solution that, that, that doesn't seem to break. I could even if I may add to that, Blair and New Labour, the, the, the solution that seemed to be the, the ultimate solution, but things change all the time. Um, and, and my own, uh, my own um, um, it was, therefore, it's very difficult to predict the future. And I think in, in some ways I have become more and more of a pessimist because everything that seems to be thoughtfully built up kind of unravels. Um, and uh, the situation in, in Ukraine is perhaps also a warning for that, because I, I'm, I must admit that I'm very pessimistic about the developments there and what they will lead to. I'm, I'm very concerned with the knock-on effect that we can't even predict. Uh, but having said that, in the Nordic countries, I think that, the, the you know, I, I sincerely hope they will continue to be stable democracies. Um, and uh, what we see now more recently in Denmark and so on, of course, is, is, is kind of... Um, um, uh, something that that at least gives some hope for the uh, inter for, for for the short to medium term future, but um, my my sort of overall longer term thoughts are that I'm quite concerned about a lot of developments. Okay, well that's an optimistic note on which to uh, end our panel. Thank you very much, uh, Anders. I'm trying to think what the Scandinavian word is for the the, the gloom word. I can't remember what it is, but uh, uh, maybe that's appropriate. Uh, this is now the end of our video panel on changing international alignments in Sweden, Denmark and Finland. I firstly want to give a big thank you to the panellists, Anders, Heike and Charlotte, who I'm sure everybody will agree have given us a really masterful uh, presentation of the issues and really enhanced all of our thinking about this, as well as bringing a bit of controversy to us that we can think about uh, how this all goes forward. I really appreciate all three of you giving your time to this and making uh, such considered interventions. I want to thank the audience for participating today. We had good and interesting questions. And I want to remind everybody that you will soon be able to find a recording of this event on our Center for Geopolitics website. And I would urge you to sign up there to receive regular information about the events in our program. Good evening and thank you for being with us.